Hi guys, I'm Andrew from Cruise Master, and today on Cruise Master Class, we're going to be talking about shock absorbers. Today we're going to be talking about how a shock absorber works, the two different types of shock absorbers, and where they're used in Cruise Master products. So a shock absorber or damper is a suspension component whose primary job is to optimise the contact between the tyre and the ground. So this gives you optimised handling and ride characteristics. They do this by controlling the energy that gets stored in the coil spring or the air spring or leaf spring in a vehicle whilst they're going over different terrains. They convert the energy from the spring, this is kinetic energy, into thermal energy and dissipate that through heat transfer into the environment. Now, a shock absorber typically has two ends. They might be eyes or they might be pins or there's some various different clevises out there, but you'll typically see an eye or a pin. One end is attached to the chassis and the other end is attached to the control arm or the axle housing of a live axle um, suspension. Under this guard here, there's a piston rod. And that piston rod is joined to this eye. And on the other end, there is a piston. And inside this body, it's full of oil. So this piston slides um, in, you know, within this tube here. And as it, as it moves inside, you get a restriction to flow. And on that piston, it's got a series of holes, which controls the flow at low speed. And then it has a collection of shims or valves, which control mid to high speed. So if you imagine you have a piston that's got no holes in it, it'd be really hard to move it within this chamber full of fluid. If it's got lots of holes in it, it'll be easier to flow through. So by controlling the viscosity of the oil, the size of the holes, and the design of the valve system in there, it allows us to, give, to build a damping characteristic. And that characteristic is dependent on a number of things. So it'll be the type of spring, spring rate, the weight of the vehicle, the suspension geometry, and all that type of thing. So it's very important that when a suspension is designed, when you want to optimize it, that you need to consider the damping of the shock absorber amongst those other components, which means you can't really just pick a generic shock absorber off the shelf and hope it's going to work on every suspension. It doesn't work like that. The expertise in making a properly controlled suspension is how you develop the damping in the shock absorber. So there are two main types of shock absorbers on the market. There's a dual tube construction and a monotube construction. In a dual tube, as the name suggests, it has two tubes within this, house, within this body here. So the central tube is called the working tube and the outside is the reserve tube. And those two are concentric. The working tube contains the piston and piston rod that we talked about earlier. And then there's a gap between that tube and the reserve tube, which houses um, excess um, oil and, the, and some gas in this case. So as you compress this together and the piston rod enters, it's going to displace an amount of oil and that oil has to go somewhere. In the dual tube case, it goes to that, um, to that reserve tube. On a, also on a dual tube, it um, generates its damping both via the piston that I talked about earlier on the piston rod, but also a second valve that separates the two working tube and the reserve tube. So they both generate damping forces. One of the benefits of a um, dual tube damper is a nice compact design. It fits into most suspension geometries and it's nicely protected against the elements. So we've got a nice stone guide on the top there and the working tube that the piston runs up and down in, which needs to be kept in, in good condition, is protected by the reserve tube. So this outer bit can cop some rocks and damage like that, and it won't affect the workings of the shock absorber. Um, in most dual tube dampers, there'll either be a, a low pressure gas or a foam sleeve in the, in the reserve tube. Both of those are there to prevent cavitation. A cavitation is little air bubbles that get formed when the shock absorber works really hard. So imagine you're hammering over corrugations and that piston's moving really fast inside there. It generates little bubbles in the oil. When you get those little bubbles, the viscosity of the oil reduces, which means you get less damping performance. That reduction is often called fade. And you don't want that if you're trying to keep that tire on the ground and, and maximize your handling. 
One of the other things that happens inside a dual tube is because we've got both a piston and a foot valve doing damping in this design, when they start working really hard, you get another phenomenon called lag. And lag happens when you're trying to suck oil in and out of the working tube through that bottom valve, it just can't keep up. And then again, you end up with a bit of a flat spot leading to um, damping degradation. So they, they have some pros and some cons. We often find that they're really good for the majority of off-road conditions we have here in Australia when they're correctly designed and valved. Um, we have quite a few in our range at Cruise Master across our different suspensions. So we have the little one at the end here. This is for our on-road suspension called GT. Um, in our range, we define um, the particular product. In this case, G30 means it's gas filled and it's got a 30 millimeter bore. So it's a, it's a smaller piston diameter. Then we move up to the shock absorber we use on CRS. This is also a gas 30 millimeter bore, but we've armored it a bit. So obviously they're different damping between the two because of the two different suspensions, but we've also armored the bottom of it for rock impacts as well, just due to where it's located in the suspension geometry. And then we step up into the two shocks we use on our XT products. So the G35 and G40, so 35 mil bore and 40 mil bore. They're both gas dampers. And you'll see there's a bit of a bulge in the body here on the 40 mil, giving us a bit more oil volume. In our case, both of these shocks have different damping. So we typically use the smaller bore shock on the lighter suspensions and, um, and most of the air products. And we use the big bore, the G40, on the heavier range of stuff just so we get more damping control out of that bigger piston. Now, heading over into monotubes. So a monotube, as it suggests, is a singular tube. So we don't have a reserve, um, a reserve tube like we have on the, on the jewels. Um, so the, just on the other side of this metal skin here is where the piston sits. So by doing that for the same size of shock absorber, we can get a much bigger piston in there, which gives us better damping control and some higher damping forces that we can obtain. Now, just like the other shock, we've got to accommodate for the volume of the rod that gets displaced when, when it's working. And that oil gets pushed through this chamber up here into this piggyback reservoir here. On a monotube, you can, you can store that volume either inside the body, you have it piggybacked like this, or you can have it on the end of a hose that's called a remote reservoir. So in this little piggyback here, there's oil, there's a little piston inside there that just moves up and down with the movement of the rod, and then a volume of gas. And that piston separates the oil and the gas. In a monotube shock, it's typically high pressure, somewhere in the order of 150 psi. So by putting that pressure onto that little piston, which pressurizes the inside of the shock, generates a substantially higher load on the oil, which really reduces cavitation almost to where it's relatively non-existent in most cases. So that allows you to um, travel over rough terrain, um, potentially harder and faster, putting more energy into the shocks and maintaining the damping performance and not having the fade characteristics. The other benefit of these is because we're only doing the damping on the piston in a monotube, um, we don't get that lag effect like we get in a dual tube, which means when you're traveling over corrugations where you're having lots of little inputs into the suspension, it can stay in contact with the ground and track the ground far better as well. We've done videos in the past comparing the two shocks and you can actually see how well the wheel stays in contact with the ground with a monotube damper. Now, it does have a lot of pros, but there are, there are you know, a couple of downsides because of the construction of it. They are more expensive to manufacture. So there's a trade-off between cost and performance there. Um, the, because we don't have a reserve tube, we have to protect the body a bit better. You'll often find them mounted um, upside down effectively like this. So the body is out of the way of the rocks. Oh, the benefit of that is it gets the mass up onto the chassis, not on the arm, which allows the arm to handle the uh, rough conditions a bit better. So th there's more manufacturing um, um, high tolerance that you need to 
consider when you get into a monotube shock. Now we have two different monotubes in the range. We have the standard monotube, which is a 46 mil bore um, on ATX. And then we have a new model, which is a 60 millimeter bore monotube on ATX Unleashed. And this guy is a bit of a beast. So we've got a much bigger body there. So we've got a storage of lots of oil and you need lots of oil in a shock absorber to um, capture the heat and then reject it to the atmosphere. And that's something I probably should have mentioned as well, that one of the benefits of a monotube is because we don't have a, basically a space between the working tube and the atmosphere, um, a monotube will reject heat a lot more effectively than a dual tube. So as you're putting all that energy in over corrugations, it will reject heat more efficiently and will stay cooler for longer. On this particular shock on the reservoir, it's finned as well. So we're getting more surface area on the, on the piggyback there to allow more heat rejection, again, for advanced cooling. And this guy also has a compression adjuster on it. So this has got eight clicks on the adjuster, which allows us to you know, fine tune the suspension to the conditions and, um, and for the weight that's carried in the vehicle. The big M60 is still under development at the moment. Um, we're hoping to release that at the beginning of 2023. As far as maintenance goes, there's a few things to look out for. One is oil on the outside of the body. And generally that will fit into two categories. One will be what we call a misting. And that's where you have a very light coating of, kind of vaporized oil on the outside. This often happens when the, when the shocks are worked hard, they warm up, and just by the movement of the rod through the seals at the top of the shock, it'll pull a little bit of oil past, which will kind of vaporize and sit on the outside of the shock. That isn't something to be worried about, it's completely normal. What we typically say is if you see it, give it a wipe, and um, if, there's, if there's no runs, then everything's all right. Now a proper leaking shock absorber will have a visual run of oil down the outside of the body. Now, again, what we advise with that is you give it a wipe, because sometimes, particularly when the shocks are new and they're gassed on the production line, as the gassing tool comes out of the, um, out of the seals and the rod guide at the top of the shock, it'll drag a little bit of oil through and it might sit on the top of the shock absorber until it gets used and warmed up a bit, then it'll end up dribbling down the side. It's best to wipe that off if it returns or you get a couple of streaks of it, then it's definitely a leaker and it needs to be replaced. During servicing, uh, at Cruise Master Tony Performance Center, we pop the bolt out the bottom of the shock and we give them a, um, a compression cycle. It just checks to make sure the gas pressure is still good in the shock and everything's still working well. Other things to look for is in the mounts. So on the dual tubes, all of ours have rubber bushes in them. You want to check the condition of those, make sure there's no play in them. On the monotube shocks, they've all got spherical bearings in them. A similar thing, make sure the bearings move nicely and there's no play in them, or they're, they're not rusted closed. And then finally, one of the biggest things is making sure that the mounting bolts are nice and tight. So consulting the owner's manual of making sure those bolts are talked up to our specifications will make sure you'll have um, no issues with your shock absorbers. At Cruise Master, we obviously take suspension very seriously and we're quite passionate about the products we make. And as such, all of our shock absorbers we design in-house, so that is choosing the lengths of them, the mounting options, the damping inside them. We have a shock absorber dynamometer in-house, which is a machine used for characterizing the shock absorbers, which allows us to tune them in-house, we quality check them in-house, and we specify them all in-house. So I can't stress that enough. When you're looking at a suspension for your vehicle or for your trailer, it might be worth asking whether where the components came from and whether they actually designed to work together. So that's it for shock absorbers today. Uh, we're always putting out new Cruise Masterclass videos, so make sure you keep an eye out on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram to make sure you don't miss out.